Well, good morning and welcome uh, to another week of adult churchwide Sunday school. And we are kicking off a new series today in our 2021 goal of reading through the Bible. And uh, so today we're actually going to cover Genesis, <laughs> Woo, all in one day. So uh, we'll do an overview and, and dive in where the spirit leads. But let us begin with a word of prayer. Loving God, you are good. And it's so important for us to remember that and help us to know your goodness in a deep and powerful way today. Lord, we lift up the prayer requests that have been shared. Um, for the life of Lewis Pretty, what an amazing, gentle, loving spirit. And he struggled for so long. Lord, we are heartbroken at the loss, but we celebrate with him and his perfect healing in these moments. So now today, as we begin this new series, guide me, guide us, may your Holy Spirit be our teacher, as we kind of find a new groove with how to do this kind of different uh, journey uh, together. Um, inspire us, God, and give us all that's needed as we walk through this. Pray this in the name of Christ. Amen. Okay, so um, we're going to go into this new study, and as I said last week, it's stretching me a little bit, but I think I'm going to probably take a few weeks to find my style. I was sharing with Bindi last night while we were driving what I thought I uh, would try to do today, and it might adapt. So please feel free to give me uh, feedback, uh, either an email or uh, other times, if, if this process is helpful. It's going to be kind of in the similar style that I've done, um, but we're using a, a very different kind of curriculum. What I wanted to start with was just a little details overview of how to uh, get connected if you're not already connected with the Bible reading plan. And it's not the end of the world. If you get behind with grace, we're going to, um, you know, just keep each other going. And, and these classes, if you were behind, I think there's going to be enough review and discussion that that'll be okay if you get behind and just stick with us. So I'm going to come over here to uh, our web page and you can go to resources here and read the Bible. 2021. Um, I'm going to keep this updated. So if you just want to uh, follow this, you can do that. You click there and it actually brings you to one you can print out. Okay. Has the same instructions at the top, but you can print out and then you can click each of these links and that's a video link for the day. Okay. So that's there. I'm going to come back to Oh, that screen keeps going up at the top. Come back over here to the web page. So there's a mobile app um, called Uversion. And if you can see my picture on the video screen, I can't see it, but there's, it says Holy Bible and it's a picture of the Bible. And you can get that and I can help you get the direct link to the group that I've started. Uh, you don't have to be in that group, but we've got a bunch of discussion going on there. It will look like this. Um, you will see this image in the app, okay? And it'll be under a plans page. So if you open the app and you go to the home screen, I don't know if you can see my camera if it's well, but there's a plans button at the bottom and it'll be there. And that's where you click the plan. After this class today, I'm happy to stay around and help people get connected, I can send you a direct invitation to the group I've started. There's almost 50 people in that group um, and we can have up to 150 people, but it's called Bible Project the Bible under plans if you wanna use the app. The other thing, as I showed you a minute ago, you can use this printable guide as well. So let me just pause for a quick minute and see if there's any questions there that wouldn't take too, too much time. I'm happy to stay at the end of class and really work with people to get it connected. Any general questions right now about that? I just want to make a, a comment. I, I was doing the, the part where you can listen to it 
Yes. Yeah, while you drive or whatever. And I, I found out they don't have all versions, so you can listen to it. That and is a good point. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to do this for just a minute. I'm going to come out here. So we're, when you're in it and you click a Bible passage, up at the top, it's hard to see, but there's a, a button to listen, but not every translation has it. So you would have to click the translation, which is at the top, and then pick one that has that. But I will, thank you for pointing that out, Michelle. I will walk through that with people after class as well. So we can all get on the same page. All right, any other brief comments about it? Otherwise we'll do it at the end. Jim. Yes, Joyce. Are the devotionals that are in the app the same thing that's listed on the written form? Yes, it is. Yes, okay. it is. I had to rewrite the whole uh, written form because uh, the written one they had had different devotions. I want us all to be on the same page. I, I told the staff, I got to rewrite this. Do you think I should? And they said, well, only if it takes you about an hour. I thought it'd only take an hour. It took me uh, eight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I but those are really good too. Yeah, we're gonna watch uh, one here right now. So, um, are we okay to move on? Yeah. All right. So, uh, I'm gonna share this screen here. Oops, I went from the beginning from current slide. Okay. So, what I want to do today, um, as you know, I'm gonna I'll show you later, but I'm gonna pull from a lot of different videos each week. Um, to try to have maybe one or two. Um, but today I want to give you a sense of what the devotional videos are like if you haven't seen them. So this is going to be a video that um, it won't be grainy when we see it. This, oh, there it is. Uh, this is what the devotions are. And these are the videos that are in that um, sheet that I just shared with you. So I'm going to share with you this one. It's about five or six minutes. Gives you an overview of Genesis and gives you an introduction to the style of the people who wrote the app, um, the Bible Project. So we'll start with our plan and give you a sense of what it's doing in uh, this series we're doing. All right. The first book in the Bible is a book you've probably heard of. It's called... Sorry. Genesis. Genesis comes from a Hebrew word. Uh, it's pronounced reshit, uh, and it just means beginning. Now, there's a lot of stories from the book of Genesis, and it's easy just to pull out a specific story and, and try to tell you what it might mean. But we think the best way to understand this book is to look at the book as a whole and show you how the whole thing is designed. The book is designed to fall into two main parts. You have uh, chapters 1 through 11, which is telling the story of God and the whole world. And then you have the second part, which is about God and Abraham's family, as chapters 12 through 50. And how the two of those parts relate, that's where you find the message of the book. Okay, so let's start back at the beginning. The first part of Genesis begins with a creation story, where God creates everything. And how exactly that happens, of course, that's where all the debates come. But he takes a dark, watery chaos and he turns it into a beautiful garden where humans can can flourish that sounds nice it does sound nice in fact seven different times god says of all that he's made that it's good and this is where we meet the first human characters in the bible adam and eve they're they're both individual characters but they're also representative adam is the hebrew word for humanity and eve is the hebrew word for life and God creates them in his image. In other words, humanity reflects or is meant to reflect the, the, the creativity, the goodness and character of the creator out into the world that he's made. And they're supposed to reproduce and make cultures and neighborhoods and art and gardens and, and everything else. But he gives them a, a moral choice about how they're going to go about building this world. And this is what the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is all about. And he tells them, don't eat of the fruit of this tree or you will die. What's that all about? So up till now, God has been the one defining and providing what is good. And so God is the one with the knowledge of good and evil. But now this tree represents a choice. Will the humans trust God's definition of good and evil? Or are they going to seize the opportunity and define good and evil for themselves? And 
Adam and Eve eat the fruit. This is the core biblical explanation for that concept of sin, that desire to call the shots myself. It's the inward turn of the human heart to do what's good for me and my tribe, even if it's at the expense of you and, and your tribe. And the problem is humans are horrible at defining good and evil without God. And so now that humanity's made this choice, things get really, really, they really bad. So Genesis three through 11 is like tracing this downward spiral of all, all humanity. So Adam and Eve, they can't trust each other anymore. And so there's a little story about how they were naked and felt fine about it beforehand, but now they feel shameful because all of a sudden Adam's definition of good and evil might be different than Eve's. And so they hide from each other. Then there's another story of temptation, Cain, is jealous of his brother Abel, and he gives in and kills him. There's a story right after Cain about a guy named Lamech, and all we know about Lamech is that he accumulates wives like property, and he sings songs about how he's a more violent, vengeful person than Cain ever was, and he's proud of it. Things get so bad with the human race that we see God decide to just wipe us out. Yeah, we typically think of the flood story is about God being angry, but it actually begins with God's sadness and grief about the state of his world. And so out of his passion to preserve the goodness of his world, he washes it clean with the flood. But there's a glimmer of hope. He, he chooses Noah and his whole family and he saves them on this boat. Yeah, don't forget about the animals. Right, and the animals. So Noah and his family are gonna reboot all of humanity. I mean, he must be a pretty great guy. But this is the story most people don't know because it's kind of weird is that Noah gets off the boat and he plants a vineyard and he gets totally plastered. And then something sketchy happens in his tent with his son. It's a tragic story. So from here, humanity grows again, but things are as bad as before. And the last story is the famous story of the Tower of Babel. And in this story, you have all of the nations uniting together to use this new technology they have, the brick. And they want to make a name for themselves and build this big city with a huge tower that will reach up to the gods. But God knows that this city will be a nightmare. And so in his mercy, he scatters them. And all of these stories, they're underlining the same basic idea. When humans seize autonomy from God, when they define good and evil for themselves, it results in a world of tragedy and death. And this leaves you wondering, is there any hope for humanity? Yes, yeah, there is. It's the very next story that answers that question. It's the beginning of God's mission to rescue and restore his world. Hey there, this is Tim. This is All right, let's see. Hold on, I'm gonna get here. All right, okay. So um, that's a little taste of the videos that they do. Um, I really like them. We picked them because they could be good for a variety of ages. And they just kind of outline different parts of the story. And then they have sometimes uh, thematic videos, like they have one on covenant and one on image of God. And so there wasn't one video that did all of Genesis, but I wanted to give you a taste and have you kind of get uh, have us dive into a little bit of Genesis with that. Would anyone like to comment on anything about the video? Either, um, you know, it, the content of it, or even the idea of how they approach their videos right now? Well, one thing I, I noticed this, this second time I've watched it, it's funny how you don't get things the first time, but the, the, their comment about uh, the new technology the brick was used basically for evil intent. I mean, usurping God, building this Tower of Babel, and how we can use technology today for good or evil. It's interesting to think about a brick as technology, but yeah. it is. But we define technology as electronic. But yeah, that's a really good point, Sherry. Thank you. Any other comments in general about that? with that shared. I've been playing around a little bit and trying to decide if I like watching the video before or after I read the verses. Um, sometimes, you know, 
it can give me a heads up on what I'm going to be reading for that day or uh, reinforce something that I've already read if I'm watching it after. So yeah, I decided which I like better yet. <laughs> I can see both sides of that one for sure. How did you, what was your thought on how they overviewed the stories on this one that we just saw? Obviously, you know, theology comes into any time someone shares. So what was your sense of how they overviewed uh, that part of Genesis? In this class, I know we've talked about some of like Old Testament, New Testament. Is it a, a just God or a judgmental God? And how do we kind of blend these views? And I think it's really amazing how they continue to show a merciful God, a hopeful God, a grieving God. Um, it's almost like you see how he's, he's still kind of with, with his creation even though they may not have been able to recognize that. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Karen. I'm going to share in just a little bit a text I got with um, all my stuff that I share today is going to be anonymous, but that is right on that theme there because um, people were wrestling with that. Anyone else just in general on that overview? Jim, I, yeah. like, the, I like the way they... Uh... They're not being overly academic with it. I mean, they they're, uh, when they when they talk about uh, Noah getting plastered, uh, just <laughs> the the phrases they use are, are uh, the they put it the way that everybody's going to understand it. <laughs> yeah, that was one of the reasons we chose it because Malia felt and Kevin both felt this could be used across some ages pretty well. Um, I did have one critique on Wednesday night of someone who wanted to go, it to go deeper, but that is the challenge of, of that, you know. Um, all right, let me do this. Uh, pipe in if you, if you want uh, at any point, but let me share on the app. Um, let me come back to that one. Well, no, let me do that. Let me go back up. Um, so let me go back to just reading and just give an opportunity for this. This question is going to be asked a lot, okay? Ultimately, I'm going to come to this question very often. Um, but is there anyone that would like to comment at this point about your reading this week? Is there something that stood out? Uh, were there some themes? Uh, Karen uh, just talked about the theme of judgment a little bit. Uh, do you have any questions, any insights? Does anyone want to offer that before I share some of the things that people have been sharing with me? Anyone want to share any insights you had this week? I'm always amazed that there were. Oh, go ahead, Ann. Bad they are. <laughs> go ahead, Ann, and then we'll go Annie. So Ann Rybolt first. I'm sorry. Um, just the stories how how uh, what I would say how bad they are how much they do as particularly uh, the way they treat their uh, women and their families and I know before when I started reading through the Bible I just had to stop because it disturbed me so much um, so it's kind of getting it through it a little bit more this time but also the fact that you can can be so bad but God still somehow figures out how to usually for good is uh, something that yes. another yes. lesson and the other thing that stood out to me is the, um, some of what Karen was saying that we usually think about the God of the Old Testament being so angry but they <clears throat> talk about how how sad God was to see um, how wicked the world had become before the flood I always had picture that more as a God so mad he's just gonna wipe you out as opposed to God is so sad this creation he thought would be beautiful it's not and uh, so it's, that's a different perspective thank you Ann. for reading this week Annie well I was just gonna say um, the challenge for me is like 30 chapters I was so used to Bible study where you go deep you take little sections at a time and you study and you pull them apart and it takes you a year to go through Genesis. Here, we're already on chapter 30. So I kind of thought, all right, I need to approach it maybe a different way. 
which is think about it like um, something on my Kindle, a piece of literature that I'm reading. And it's just an ongoing story and not worrying about trying to pick out a lot of things. And maybe I talked about this with my Bible study leader that I meet with on Wednesdays is the approaching it with the idea of themes and keeping a running list of the themes that come up because, you know, we teach kids that if you know that themes repeat over and over in all kinds of literature. So if you know some common themes, you'll be able to spot them when they show up in whatever piece of literature you're reading. So I thought, all right, let, you know, let me just start an ongoing list of themes. So like Anne was saying, evil, <laughs> mercy, you know, uh, kindness or regeneration, and just start listing them out so that as you read through, you, those themes will come up again and again, and maybe we'll be able to spot them. So I, I'm, in other words, I'm just trying, in the graphic novel thing, I'm just trying to think about what are different ways to approach this year than I've done in the past with Bible studies. That is such good insight. Yeah, because it is a different way to approach it. When I got to today, I was so surprised we were already through Genesis. I mean, granted, we did 10 days, you know, to get up to today. But anyone else in general? Let me share with you some... On the, on the app, there is an opportunity to, what's it called? It's called Talk It Over. And uh, if you're in my group, I'm sharing, there's about 45 people in my group, and about 10 of them have been uh, writing some comments each day. And I'm just going to share with you some of those comments, go through each day and just share some. I'm going to do this really, really quick um, and then ask kind of that same question. But uh, all these, I'm, I didn't get permission, so it's just all anonymous here. But on day one, Genesis 1 through 3, we had someone who said, God created everything. It was very good. God brings order out of chaos and walks with us through it all. I love that. Someone else said, God allows us the opportunity to make our own choices, and temptation is always there. This person is a younger person. I will say that. This is someone who's in college, and I'm just loving this person's comments because you'll, you'll maybe recognize the spirit um, in some other ones, but said, I feel like from this reading, God was reminding me to trust his plan and his will. I also felt like he was saying that what I want is not always what is best for me. From day two, someone shared, uh, what do I call on? What do I depend on? How often do I try and take things into my own hand? Trust God, release to God, depend on God. I falter, but in all these things, it's not about perfection, but walking with the Lord and he forgives, renews, restores, and meets us where we're at. He desires relationship. My heart yearns to walk with the Lord, trusting in him, and not in what I can control or create, but in relationship with Christ trusting him and following the Holy Spirit. I love this person just really making it personal that way. Uh, today, I felt like God was reminding me that he is present even in the mundane parts of my life. I also feel like he's telling me that the smallest amount of trust in him is enough. From day three, uh, someone wrote, God goes with us through the storms. God can be trusted. God is faithful sovereign and his grace is greater than our rebellion a powerful phrase there his grace is greater than our rebellion uh, the rainbow was a sign for a covenant between god and humans god would never forget this promise god never breaks his promises to us whenever i see a rainbow it's a reminder to me that all god's word is truth he's given us his word to instruct and guide us so obviously this was from the flood chapters from day four uh, after the flood, this uh, is a story. This story is a reminder to me that we can't put God into a box, and we that we can understand. We will never be able to comprehend Him. We need to have faith in God's plan. Um, as we get into the stories of Abram uh, in that second part of Genesis after chapter twelve, Abram looked to God and trusted God. Not perfect. And sometimes in a mess, uh, but that's where God desires to meet us and have relationship with us and lead us. From day five, my surface level thought of the day was that I think it's hilarious that Sarah argued with God about whether or not she laughed. 
<laughs> Just picturing it made me chuckle. I felt like God was telling me that what we deem as impossible will never be impossible to God. I think that was that same college student I was talking about earlier. Or maybe this one is. I get chuckled at the thought of Sarah denying her laughter. It reminded me of how Adam and Eve tried to hide from God, but he knew exactly where they were. There's not a single thing that we can hide from God. The things I've been learning is to trust God's guidance, and he has a great plan for us. We just have to make the decision to trust God's words and obey what he commands us to do. From day six, when humanity tries to intervene for God, it brings disaster. As believers, we need to have faith and know that God will work all things out for our good and his purpose. My first thoughts from these readings from day six is that the Bible could be made into a great soap opera. <laughs> There's a lot of drama in these chapters that I didn't know about. The biggest takeaway that I got from today is that if it was God's, that if God calls you to a place, he will provide for you there. I think this is another college student uh, that's in our group. With this reading, I'm reminded that God will always provide. From day seven, he provides for us always. We just have to trust in him. From day eight, we have two options to live into our inheritance or despise it. Esau stated his birthright wasn't any count since he was about to die anyways, or didn't count because he was about to die anyways. We, we've been given an inheritance from God, such as his grace, his holy word, and being adopted in his family. So often we find ourselves tempted by worldly pleasures. God reminded me to focus on him and be grateful for the inheritance I've received. And I'm just copying these straight from, so typos are in there. Where do we fix our eyes? What do we fix our eyes upon? I love that. So someone in their comments, just put some questions. That's what stood out. All right, where are we fixing our eyes? Where's our focus? And day nine, uh, which is all I stopped at day nine for this week, God uses broken, imperfect humans to fill his, fulfill his plans. And even in those times, so much evil, trickery, and lying going on at that time, I'm thankful God had a plan from the beginning to redeem his people and to reconcile us to Jesus. This is, oh, that was, I thought it was going to be a continuation. Um, and reconcile us to him by Jesus. So any thoughts on those? Let me come out. I've got another one I want to share, but I want to see... Did that bring up anything for anybody? Hearing what some other people were saying and responding to. Anyone? All right. That gives you, or go ahead, Rybolts. I think I saw you unmute. I'm just curious if um, in reading parts of Genesis, uh, it brought to mind the ideas about prosperity gospel, which... Mm. You normally reject knowing that people can <clears throat> have people can be God followers and have good or bad things happen in their life is not guaranteed. I say that because they <clears throat> always not that you shouldn't be grateful, but they saw everything in reflection. They got more sheep, more goats, more land, more wives. And that was always defined as God. And so if you're faithful to God, you're suddenly going to have all this stuff. Is, yeah. the, is that's the temptation, uh, the theological temptation, I think is what I hear you saying. Yeah. Yeah, so it didn't exist just after the gospel, the prosperity gospel. It's been throughout history that people have been tempted to think that. Thank you, Tom. Part of my reflection from the, I guess, yesterday or the day nine was almost like the opposite of that, though. It was like, here you have this most deceitful, person um tricking his brother and yet receiving this blessing and mom and dad I thought of you because you constantly taught and no not because of the deceit sorry <laughs> <laughs> wait wait till I finish um I thought of y'all because um an emphasis on unconditional love which I don't I mean I still don't think I fully understand but I see the need for it as I care for my own children, but it's like, 
wow, like God's faithfulness doesn't depend on our goodness or what we've done, but it's actually, it's like almost like in, in his hands and his desire. And it's just like freely given. So I, I didn't yeah. show you to the deceitful person. I thought of you showing love. Well, you got it. <laughs> All right. Anyone else? I'm going to share one more comment. This is the one that came in a text and it's, it's kind of longer here. Okay. This was on the theme of judgment that um, Karen was talking about earlier and I had a member text me and I got permission to share this. They're not in class with us today. Um, not in this class. So <laughs> they said, Genesis is giving me fits. <laughs> it has always has along with a lot of the Old Testament. I think I'm going to go back to the beginning and write down all the passages where I can't see the love, then go and read as many different translations as I can to see if one of them will phrase it in such a way that I can see it. Might need to read some commentaries as well. She continues, I need to finally reconcile this God that seems to be full of vengeance, anger, and judgments from the Old Testament with the God that Jesus shows us in the New Testament. How can I tell someone else that he is love when I see so many examples that seem to contradict that? I really need to know that he has always been about love. Otherwise, why would he love someone like me right now? Um, does anyone resonate with that? I mean, that was a pretty personal sharing there. <laughs> anyone resonate with that? I'm seeing some nods. Anyone want to respond to that? I had a response. It wasn't actually that response. It was a reflection I wrote earlier in the week um, that I'm going to share. But before I do that, does anyone want to comment on Jim, that? Yeah, Lewis. I'll offer something. I have always thought that the, the God that is, and we need to remember that the Old Testament was written by the Jews who saw God as a fear fearsome character, whereas in the New Testament, God is love. So what you're it's saying different. is that there's a perspective, a filter we have on that how we describe, we can take some of that into account as well. Is that what I hear you saying? Well, th that's just basically the difference in the, the Old Testament, New Testament. Okay. Uh, the Old Testament consistently decide, describes God as a God of wrath. In the New Testament, God is love. And as for those who haven't been here, we did a whole session, maybe a couple sessions on what is God's wrath uh, over the summer. Um, and if we get this far today, <laughs> the next video section that I have, um, one of the parts of it talks about what you were just saying, Lewis. Um, all right. Anyone else want to comment on that, on that judgment piece? Well, just to jump in, and this kind of connects back to my earlier, I'll give a real quick specific example. Ann and I had a friend in college. He wanted to become a physician and a missionary, um, and he started medical school, and then he <clears throat> was failing. And why was that? It turned out he had a brain tumor, and then he died <clears throat> at maybe... 23 or something. So, you know, in a, a strict, of, you know, one way to look at it, which I reject it, obviously, is say, oh, well, he wasn't doing what God wanted, so therefore he got punishment. Somebody else made it through medical school, therefore they were rewarded. And that's the, <clears throat> that's the thing I think I have to be careful with when I refer to prosperity you know, we saw a lot of Jesus followers suffered a lot. It wasn't like, oh, they were, it was all ease. So I, I think it kind of ties in with this. I mean, we don't understand, we don't have a perfect understanding of God and kind of what Lewis was saying. You know, when they, when they talk about this is why God did something or how, I don't know that they had a perfect understanding. The perfect understanding came through Jesus. So anyway, that helps me kind of 
say, I don't understand, it's confusing yeah. and not simple plus or minus arithmetic. Yeah, I was really grateful this person was that got honest with me because those are questions I've heard haunt a lot of people. In youth ministry, I heard them a lot, but a lot of times as adults were like, I'm not sure I should be able to ask that now, you know? <laughs> I should know the answer to that. Um, yeah. But, yes, Joyce. <clears throat> the thing that gets me is that God seems so unfair because, you know, someone steals another person's birthright or his inheritance and God rewards him. And that's, that's where I get hung up is like, <clears throat> where's the vengeance for the person who's sinning? But, you know, so <laughs> maybe we can explain that. Well, I mean, I don't, I took, that's a question too. That's a tough story in the stealing of the birthright, you know? So um, let me share this one thought that I shared that doesn't certainly answer that, Joyce. I, I wrestle with that as well. Um, let me share this and get your thoughts. Hold on. I'm on the wrong thing here. There we go. Okay. Um, all right. So I had written on day three um, this in just the comments. So I hadn't received that text yet. But I said, these can be challenging passages of Genesis, especially if we come to see God like a dictator who inflicts, punish, inflicts punishment on those who disobey. Some of you who know me will recognize these thoughts, <laughs> by the way. Rather than punishment, uh, judgment is the consequence of human beings living outside of God's design. Put a bag over your head and you will suffocate as you break the law of respiration. Step out of a 10-story window and you will fall as you break the law of gravity. As we live outside of God's design, we experience death and destruction. This is judgment. But as we see over and over in scripture, as God comes to us in our experience of this judgment and re restores us, or to restore and redeem, the ultimate evidence of this is Christ. But it is so awesome to recognize that God had been doing this since day one in the garden and in the saving of the earth after the flood. The rainbow is God's reminder that after we experience any storm, God's promise is forever true. Anyone want to comment on that before I move forward? Judgment is a huge theme. <laughs> um, anyone want to comment on that? But the little video <clears throat> that our those guys put together for us. If you go to the second one where he talks about from 12 on, he said, he reminds us that there's that theme of repeated failure. Like Abraham failed over and over and over again. And yet there was still forgiveness. Jacob fails over and over and over again, but there's forgiveness. Thank goodness, because I fail over and over and over again. Um, and there is forgiveness. So, um, you can focus on the judgment part of it, or you can focus on the, the forgiveness part of it. And, yeah. and maybe that's the point of having these flawed people. Um, you know, you, you figure a Bible writer could write about any person they wanted to. Why did they pick these folks? Well, God chose these folks. Why did he choose these folks? Because they're not perfect. Um, but maybe that's part of the revelation is that despite the fact that I'm perfect and you're not, there's still a place for you in my kingdom. In this next uh, video, which is from one of the other sources, I don't know that we'll get to this part. I had to break the video up because it's pretty long. But in one of the later segments, he does a really good job of, he says, he was talking about natural disaster. And he said, in the Bible, the way they saw it, the lens through which they saw it with, was always whatever happened naturally in the world was God's action. If this happened, it was God's punishment. If this happened, and we in our world have come to some different conclusions about that. You know, when the tsunami happened and we had all these people saying, oh, that was God's judgment on those people. There's a, we don't necessarily see it that way anymore, but in the Old Testament, they always saw it that way. Um, I will send this video out if we don't get to all of it, but, um, let me keep going. Any other thoughts there? I'm going to dive into this next part, if not. Jim, just real quick. That just yep. reminded me of when Jesus in the New Testament said, you know, like y'all are asking, is it because of his sin or his parents' sin? 
Right. And, right. and neither is true. It's so that you could see God's glory. And I think in a lot of ways, we can ask that as we look at the Old Testament and see these different stories. Is this, is this their sin or their parents' sin or humanity's sin? Or is it so that God's glory could be revealed to us? In all things, God works for good. Yeah. Thank you, Karen. All right, so for this week, I looked at the videos and teachings from all of these different sources, from Disciple Bible Study, the Adult Bible Study Series, and Covenant and Bible Project, which we've already seen. And I chose a video for this week from Covenant Bible Study. Now, I, I lied apparently last week. I, I hadn't completely done my research. I thought all the videos were less than like eight minutes. Well, this one was 18 that I'm gonna to show today. So what I did is I broke it down into little segments. Um, so we're going to use some uh, teaching from the Covenant Bible Study series, and these are I, these are the segments as I named them: <laughs> uh, beginnings, what went wrong, God does a new thing, covenant conflict, and God's presence. I don't see us getting through all of them today, but I will share the video with everybody uh, afterwards. Um, but. I'm going to at least start with beginnings and maybe go in order, but if our discussion goes somewhere in the next 15 minutes, then I will click to another part of the video. So beginnings, and in this part, they're talking about who are we, why are we here, and where do we fit? And this just kind of sets things up a little bit. Um, let me, I need to go to the internet here, and that went to five minutes. Okay. I'm gonna skip their little intro here. We start with Genesis, which means beginnings, right? And and as it starts, it opens right away with these beautiful relationships, with God's relationship to us, to the world. And it answers some of the most basic questions we're still asking, like who we are and why we're here, where we fit and how we should live. Help us understand how this unfolds in this beautiful opening. The main thing that the writers of Genesis were thinking about when they wrote the book of Genesis, wasn't just beginning, but who they were mm -hmm. in the world, who they were in their own community, who they were in relation to other communities, who they were in relation to the entire world they lived in. And in order to articulate that, they told the story of their beginnings. Mm -hmm. So the real question they were wrestling with in Genesis is the main one that we wrestle with. And that is, who are we? How do we fit in? Mm -hmm. How do we fit into our family? How do we fit into the cultures we live in? How do we fit into the natural world, especially today when it's so fragile and there are so many problems? And you know, you think about religion um, and spiritual conversation being so individual or personal and yet that's almost the exact opposite of what Genesis introduces us to, that everything is within community. Everything seems to be happening within relationship. There's a connectedness um, that you see here. It's much more than a God and me picture that they're drawing when they're trying to answer this question of who am I and who are we? And the very first statement they make about who they are is that they are members of the community of creation. That's mm -hmm. why the story starts with creation. So in a way, the first answer to the question of who are we is we're members of the community of life. And wow. here is where we fit in. And here is what our responsibilities are in those communities. And those are the first two chapters of Genesis. All right, I'm gonna pause there. That doesn't take it through the whole thing but I wanna to get to some of the other ones. What, what thoughts do you have on that? Uh, sometimes just that way of how he's, they're summarizing the creation story and who we are and moving from this individualistic, which we tend to get, especially here in the Western world, to this sense of 
we are part of the family of all creation. Anyone want to respond to that? All right. I felt like that was that was good. He talks more about uh, those things in the next few minutes um, on that, but that that was a good insight for me of just remembering, uh, you know, who we are in that way. So let me. What's sure. gotta, yeah? Go ahead, Mike. Um, just forward. yeah. Uh, just to uh, throw out. Okay, you've got where we've been working is uh, the image of God. And now you have the community of creation. So that that makes us all, as members of the community of creation, <clears throat> we have to look for the image of God in everybody, whether we like them or not. <laughs> I love it. Thank you. That's a great, great point. Thank you. Can I add one point? Yes. Oh, yes, David. I love uh, it. From the biology professor. Yes. <laughs> From the discussion and some of the texts you put up and so forth, um, and the way it's presented, I feel like we're falling into the trap of focusing uh, so much on transcendence, so that the story, even as presented by the the people who created the narration and the cartoons, it's a very transcendent picture. And then in a lot of the texts and um, it's not like any one of them is problematic in my mind. It's just when you collect them all together, you start to see how quickly we are anthropomorphizing God. It's his, he, he, his, his, he, which also seems very transcendent. And what I feel like people miss a lot with the creation story is the, that the story of imminence is already present. Imminence doesn't come in the New Testament, when Jesus arrives, that's kind of a fulfillment of imminence, but imminence is there right from the, the beginning, depending upon how one looks at the creation story. So if, if creation is this entity that a transcendent God fabricated, that's one image. But if the creation is more of a kenotic emptying of God, then God is present in the creation. We don't just look for it in our community. We look for it in the tree. We look for it in the river, not in a pantheistic way. The tree is not a God. The river is not a God, but in a panentheistic way that God is present in all those things and not just those things, but in us. So as we begin moving towards locating what is the image of God, Again, we don't want to look transcendently away. We want to look imminently inward and out. And I just feel like some of the, it, when I've been in um, Sunday schools or Bible studies or settings where they talk about Genesis, I just feel like we fall in that trap right from day one of transcendence and uh, God is up separate from creation. And um, I don't know, I just... That always is a concern. Thank you. Yeah, that is, and it's maybe not just Genesis, but boy, does this bring that out, that that's a challenge we wrestle with all the time, you know, of putting God out there, up there, over there, you know, instead of with Emmanuel with us. And we wait till Jesus, and only when we talk about Jesus do we talk about God with. But I think what I hear you saying is we need to remember that is also what we hear in this story of creation. Am I rewording that right? Yeah, I just feel when we jump to the anthropomorphic, God is a part, you know, it's a he up there, then it's so easy then to fall into the God is judgmental, wrathful, puppet master, um, controlling, all that. I just, it's an easy trap to fall into, I think. Let me open that up. That uh, brings some different thoughts that we hadn't brought. What do you guys think on that? I agree. Thank you, Lewis. That, I mean, that's a good reminder to us of how we kind of read a lot of these things um, over this. Anyone else want to comment on that? That's a, a good point. It, the whole thing of God walking in the garden, God uh, being 
present, God, uh, in, in the story of uh, Abraham, God was uh, walking around uh, intimate with Abraham with, uh, and um, not just someplace else. Uh, that, that's an interesting thought. It is. Um, thank you so much. So I am sitting here. We're at ten seventeen, and I <laughs> have. I mean, Annie, this is the challenge right here, <laughs> trying to cover a lot. And I have a bunch more of that video, but I don't know. I want to honor time and all of that. I certainly will send that out. So I'm trying to uh, go. Okay, how do we kind of? some some of this up uh, we could keep discussing really well and then i'm like oh well let's just keep going next week well then we'll get behind us <laughs> so this is good we're going to trust the holy spirit i think there's one topic i want to bring up and i'm not sure if i show that section of the video that it will make sense without the section before it but something that is really important and the bible project had a video dedicated to this is the idea of covenant and I love the way this video that I was going to show talks about covenant. But basically, it's God's promise. Covenant is this relationship, but God always takes the initiative in God's covenant with us through his promises. And we can live into that covenant. And when we do, um, you know, the fullness of that covenant connection and relationship, we get to experience. When we don't, and we continue to... Uh, try to live separate from that, then we experience judgment, we experience consequences and all that. But I think the thing of covenant, you first hear it, I think, with Abram. No, the first covenant, I think, is the rainbow. And then Abram, and you hear throughout scripture, this coming back to the covenant, coming back to the same promise, all the way from the beginning. We go our own way, God comes and gives this reminds us of the covenant he's made and is always working to continue to bring life out of chaos, which was a metaphor within the creation story. Does anyone else want to comment on covenant that feels important? So thematically, as you read Genesis, we're finishing that up this week and get into Exodus, where do you see that theme of covenant? Um, and I bet we're going to continue to talk about these themes of judgment as well and the character and nature of God. How do we understand how God is portrayed in the Old Testament versus how God is expressed in the New Testament? And how do we reconcile those? Any other thoughts? I feel like I've left out so much, but <laughs> I want to always leave it up for discussion. Well, one thing I was going to say along with, uh, well, <laughs> this I'm kind of going backwards a little bit, but along with what David was saying, um, and of course, everybody knows this, Jesus is the whole difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament, and his blood, and going from the judgment to the low thought, I think, but um, time is a construct for humans, so we can make sense of the world, and God sees this whole continue, I mean, that, that's, that's one of the worst concepts to grasp, that God sees the beginning and the end of all this, all of what we're going to do and everything. And it's just, and then man's free will. It's just hard. But anyway, um, Abraham's was, uh, his faith was, a, was, he was ascribed righteousness due to his faith. And to the thought of Jacob's deceitfulness, maybe Jacob's faith was ascribed to him as righteousness, despite the fact he was kind of a deceiver. <laughs> uh, through and aren't we all a mix of it all? Yeah. <laughs> you know, um, you know, when we read some of what uh, Ann Reibolt was talking about in the evil, I just was thinking about what we're experiencing right now mm -hmm. in the world. And we have a God who is living into that covenant. How do we live into it on our end? Because God initiates it, how do we live into it on our end? Um, so much we could get into. Okay, anyone else? Mm -hmm. So many themes we could get into. <laughs> All right, so um, I think I'm going to call it there for time's sake. 
knowing that we're in a learning curve here of how we cover a chunk of stuff in an hour. Um, my main theory at this point of how to move forward is to trust the Holy Spirit and what the Holy Spirit brings up and we go with that versus an agenda that I created in my plan. <laughs> um, and so we're going to learn and I thank you for your patience with me because <laughs> this is big chunks as Annie was talking about earlier. I will include that video, the whole video um, that I was just showing. You have to have a subscription to Amplify, but the church pays for that. So I'll give you the link on how to sign up if you haven't already done that. And then we'll keep going into Exodus for next week. <laughs> um, and I will close in prayer and then stay on for anyone who wants to talk through how to use the app, if those kind of questions. Any other final thoughts? And don't hesitate to email me, not only about just the, the lesson and those kind of things, but also even teaching style or, or the challenges or what's working for this time, because we're going to be in a learning curve these first few weeks. So awesome. All right, let me share a prayer. Loving God, you are so good. Um, and I, I, I pray that every time now, because uh, I, can, I can see it in other ways. I like that. Um, idea of not just seeing you in this transcendent way, but in this omniscient way that you are here with us. Um, so God, help us, guide us as we look through this to really um, not only know who we are, as we were just talking about, but know who you are. Guide us in that. Lord, this week, may we see your presence in this world and respond to it faithfully amidst all the challenges that are happening, may your light be the one that shines brightest in this darkness, and may we be reflectors and magnifiers of that in our response, in our daily life, in our knowing. Lord, we love you and thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.